One of my first hobby obsessions was the early era of JRPGs. I would spend hours upon hours with my favorite games, often rented from local video stores, and I would pray that the save files wouldn't be erased before I got a chance to rent them again. And there have been a lot of varying tributes to this video game era on the tabletop landscape, but Encounters Shattered Wastes, the self-published boss battler by Ryan Farmer, is one of the few to go beyond simple aesthetic cash-in and reach for something that uh, tries to honor the overall oeuvre, the, the tone, the aesthetic, and the substance of the genre. However, like the fairly nondescript but also pretty cumbersome name, there has to be more than just nailing vibes for success. So let's take a look to see if Encounters delivers the goods. Bosses, we got them! Each session of Encounters pits two to four heroes in a turn-based battle against an automated boss with its own unique stats, powers, and behavior deck that have taken down final forms into a mightier version, often with accelerated fury and a new set of baddie behavior cards. Heroes, on the other hand, work together, employing the unique abilities and cards equipped at the start of the game drawn from loadouts prompted by your character's realm of expertise. Wizards get more wizardy stuff, whackers get more punchy stuff, you know, spoony bards got a spoon. But bosses aren't the only ones packing secret powers on the verge of defeat. Either as an action or when pushed too high on threat, a third pillar stat to juggle along with health and magic points, the character shatters, becoming a more powerful but ultimately doomed side of their character, with stronger passive powers, rolling more attack dice, and landing easier critical hits fueling their new shattered abilities with corruption which will eventually overcome them as sure as death. But defeat the boss's second half and survive its final blow before all characters are wiped and the heroes win. Fail to do so and you might have to share digs with Cyrus, Leo, and a certain flower girl. Conceptually, the game is pretty straightforward, and while you might expect that this is a game destined for connectivity through a campaign with town events and character unlocks and story progression and other some such, especially considering the inspiring genre loves to revel in its excess, the default mode of Encounter Shattered Wastes is a one-and-done game session with an alternative way of playing through a light campaign mode that has persistent damage, a roster of heroes that dies out on you, and accompanying unique locations and equipment cards are integrated. And this is one of the areas of the game that I wish that there was more development, more hooks and locks, and larger scale decisions to be made. If not story progression, then at least more character progression, and leveling up, and you know skill development, and seeing yourself grow in interesting and strategic ways that give you more room to explore the systems and have consequential outcomes. Don't get me wrong, I actually really like the standard one and done mode. I just feel like if you're going to have a connected campaign, this is kind of a half measure. That said, one area where the game doesn't fail to innovate and emulate is in the combat which is pretty much the whole game, so let's break it down. Lanes and phases, phases and lanes. Each round starts with the boss taking threat cards initially from their stamina deck, but if there's none there, they take threat cards from the fatigue stack, trust me, this is important, and put one in each lane with one or more heroes. Then, based on the boss card, a number of dice are rolled per hero and more threat cards are added to corresponding lanes, after which it's the hero's time to activate. See those threat cards they put out? Well, those are your targets to attack. Threat cards as a whole represent the boss's health, but as individual cards are timed attacks that will go off if undealt with. Think of them as the moving tendrils of the boss swinging in but also leaving itself exposed for damage. 
players can choose the order to activate heroes at two actions each, attacking, using special actions on cards, resting or repositioning around upcoming threats. There's actually a ton of tactical nuance and spacing and order of operations here, especially as your attack roll has to be higher than your character's current threat level to hit, knocking out a number of threat cards equal to your damage, putting them over into the boss's fatigue, unless their stamina is empty, in which case they're staggered and knocked out threat cards get sent to the wounds, totally out of rotation. If the boss ever takes damage while there's no cards in stamina or fatigue, it swaps out to its bigger, nastier side. Knock out all the boss's threat cards to wounds again, and you win. We got some tricky pickles on our hands. See, this whole exchange of the threat cards going from stamina and then you knocking them away into fatigue and eventually draining the stamina such that the boss becomes staggered and any future damage onto these threat cards goes into wounds is the whole network through which you are going to spend every ounce of your preventative and managerial energy working against and timing it just right so that way you can swing heavy when the boss is staggered is tough. When you damage a threat card, your character's threat level increases. They've gotten the boss's attention, making it harder for them to succeed in hits without spending precious time taking rest actions. At the end of each round, the boss activates threat cards if enough threat icons have built up, then one in each lane with a hero for good measure. And if you thought clearing the threat cards in the lanes with your heroes is an active preventative measure to avoid damage and destruction, well, you're wrong because each boss on both sides of the boss has their own unique rage card deck. And if there's no threat cards in the area, then one of these big, nasty, unique boss specific rage cards gets flipped and you have to suffer the penalties for that on all heroes in that lane. Often much nastier than just letting a threat card go off in your zone, so you're going to make strategic decisions about how you're going to manage this, sometimes taking a hit from a threat card as a preventative measure and to avoid taking the threat pump that happens when you successfully hit it. And if you didn't manage to swing heavy enough to flip the boss to the other side or finally kill it in its second form when it's in its staggered mode, then at the end of the round, it ends up going back to its standard non-staggered ready state and all the cards from fatigue shift back over into stamina ready to be deployed again in an albeit smaller stack. Get in a good rhythm, repeat a few cycles with smaller and smaller stacks, survive long enough, and you'll eventually see victory. Encounters is an addictive, if slightly janky game, which in a lot of ways works in its favor. Finding card combos like exploiting predictive critical hits, both sending threat cards to wounds even if unstaggered and avoiding threat can be a path to victory, and sometimes rolls just work out miraculously or fail miserably. Sure, to hit you just have to exceed threat, which is a manageable curve, but rest actions to reduce threat are based on a die roll. Crit that, and your threat can drop to zero or mana regenerate, but you could also just as easily roll a really un helpful one, but ultimately these are things that you can account for. The game does a fantastic job of telegraphing possibility and leaving it in your hands to work around, so exploits and jank become worthy allies. And speaking of allies, the array of heroes are fantastic, each with diverse abilities and stats. One of the joys of the game is just picking different heroes and different cards that they can draft into play and seeing what you can wring out of those unique combinations. So far, five games in, I'm finding it tight, unique, and hard. Three of those five games were against the third boss in order of difficulty, and to my delight, I started reflecting hard on interesting strategies, better ways to use synergies between characters, make more informed decisions at loadout, and look for ways to defuse the worst the baddie had to throw at me. While I found the rhythm of the threat cards kind of foreign at first, having to refer back to the rulebook again and again to make sure that I was handling things in the proper order, not 
not out of complexity so much as lack of precedent, I have gotten into a really good groove. I do wish that there were some efforts to overcome some of the pitfalls of cooperative gaming, like quarterbacking. After all, pretty much all decisions available to all players are visible on the table. But the flip side of this is that it makes it so managing multiple heroes when playing solo isn't a total chore. And the way the boss levels up and heroes can shatter into more dangerous and risky versions of themselves makes for a really climactic, desperate, and theatrical arc, only emphasized by the optional luxurious acrylic stands and playmat in my edition, even if they're a total pain to get back into the box. Encounters is such a specific title, relying on both a love of really hard tactical cooperative games and the 80s and 90s JRPGs that it evokes, making it very much fitting into the not-for-everyone camp. But it's got the goods. I mean, yeah, it has style, but there's a lot of nuance and substance too. Aware that inspiration and homage goes far beyond than just nailing a vibe. And that's our review. But let me know, do you have a beloved game from your childhood in this JRPG realm? And who is your favorite playable character? And what is your favorite rumor of a playable character that wasn't actually in the game, but you chased it down nonetheless? Put it in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting. Thanks for being such an awesome community. You know that I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald.